Hi, chaps. Um, it's very nice to be here. I was very flattered to be asked to come on because they phoned me up and they said, we'd like you to do a charity show. We don't really want you. We wanted the thin one, but never mind. <laughs> but it's very nice to be here. And it's very nice of you to take the trouble to come out here this evening because you could have stayed in and had a lovely, cosy domestic evening at home, couldn't you? You young couples. Daphne, why is your Dutch cap on the draining board? What? <laughs> Oh, I don't recommend them Dutch caps. No, because they're too small to make your ears itch. I don't like that. <laughs> oh, sorry, excuse me. Just having a bit of trouble with my playtex discontinued. No, it's all right. <laughs> the, the terrible thing's bras. I read this thing once in a magazine, and it was a test to see whether you needed to wear one or not. Oh. And the test was if you could hold a pencil underneath. It's very depressing for me. I think I could hold a small branch of W. H. Smith. <laughs> what do you mean, why are bras meant to lift and separate anyway? I mean, if God had meant them to be lifted and separated, they'd give them one on each shoulder. <laughs> That's magazines for you, see, they just set your worry in. And they're all the same, they'll copy off each other. I mean, if Cosmopolitan comes out one month with an article, Orgasms and How to Get Them, Woman's Realm will be there the week after. Orgasms and how to knit them. <laughs> I, read, I read a very serious article this morning in Cosmopolitan. It was called, um, Sexual Harassment at Work. Is it a problem for the self-employed? <laughs> oh, <clears throat> I just have to hope my voice holds out. This is the only other thing. Because I've had trouble with the cold. Well, snot I've had trouble with, actually. <clears throat> this is why we do charity shows, so we can say words like snot. But I think it's all right. <laughs> I got this stuff, um, Sinex, and you put it up your nose, you go, and it all goes. And you think, well, that's marvellous. Where does it go? <laughs> Take your socks off and you find out. But, no. no, see, I've been swimming, that's why I've got a cold. I go to this very posh pool at White City. There's a terrible draft when the greyhounds go past. <laughs> it's mainly, it's mainly women, you know. You've got the odd man ploughing up and down like a hairy torpedo. But mainly it's women. <laughs> And they all swim with their heads out of the water. <laughs> so as not to splash their cigarettes. And, <laughs> and I went, and I, and, I, and I lost a contact lens. And they had to drain the whole pool. And I was so embarrassed, I just grabbed the first thing I could see. And I think this is a Veruca. <laughs> so. and, then, and then I got this cold, you see, so I thought, well, I'll go to the doctor. Well, I hadn't been to the doctor for years, not since I thought you had to be inoculated for the Isle of Man. You know, you know I still feel you should be. And I went, I went to this little back street and I saw this plaque that said, Dr. Greville, fully qualified doctor and carpet fitter. Let us loose lay your lino. So I went in and there's a room full of very sort of poorly looking people, you know, even the goldfish had a little scarf around its neck. And the receptionist said, can I help you? And I said, yes, you could put that machine gun down, please. I said, um, can I see the doctor? She said, I'm afraid that's not possible. I said, well, can you draw me a picture of him? <laughs> By the time I got in to see him, you know, the price of fish fingers had gone up three times. But he obviously liked to drink, you know, because the surgical spirit was nine up next to the slimline tonic and the ice bucket. <laughs> and he had a touch of the DTs. I thought at first his desk had just clicked onto final rinse and spin. <laughs> You're supposed to go to your chemist, you see, not the doctor, because chemists know everything. So, of course, there was a huge queue of people checking up on the theory of relativity. So I thought, well, shall I ask the assistant? Well, she looked a bit dim, you know, she stood there buffing up her engagement ring with a bunion pad. I thought, no, it's nice to know people can be vacant and engaged, you know, at the same time. There's going to be a party tonight if we finish in time. I'm not very good at parties. I always get there too early. I always get everywhere too early. I turn up at funerals before people have died. You know? but I'm, I'm just not very good at talking to people, so I, I always end up sort of clearing glasses and wiping ashtrays. I get invitations now that say, don't bring a bottle, bring a damp cloth. And I always get stuck with those men that nobody else wants to talk to. Remember one with the most terrible toupee? I thought at first he had a very tired gerbil on the top of his head. <laughs> I was kissing him, you see, because this seemed preferable to talking to him. <laughs> and he was the sort that gets his tongue right in there, you know, as a good root round. And they said, what's the matter? You know, have you dropped something behind one of my tongues? <laughs> I, I can't escape from boring people always getting stuck on landings with couples who've done their own conveyancing. <laughs> Once I got stuck with a man who'd done his own vasectomy. <laughs> Surely you 
need one other person, you know, just to put their finger on the knob. You, know? <laughs> you can't leave a party. If you try and leave early, there's somebody having sex on your anorak. Like, sorry, can I just, please? <laughs> Your bums are my mittens, thank you. But oh, look, no, look, getting terribly cross. I'm going to, I'm going to really um, lower the tone. This is, a, this is a little monologue for Christmas, entitled, It was Christmas Eve in the Crescent. It was Christmas Eve in the Crescent. All the children were in their pyjamas. All the parents were snappy, tense and unhappy, except two who were in the Bahamas. <laughs> a child lay asleep in his bedroom. He was horribly red-faced and porky. He'd caused family rifts by requesting his gifts, a computer, ten quid and a Yorkie. <laughs> In the lounge sat his mother and father, in not the most pleasant of humours. Grandma was there, collapsed in a chair, having just overdosed on satsumas. <laughs> it was cold in the lounge room that evening. They had a gas fire, but they'd lost it. It was frozen and murky, and so was the turkey. They'd left it too late to defrost it. <laughs> the door of the lounge room burst open. There stood Santa Claus, reeking of liquor. He said, I'm 19 stone too. I get stuck down the flue. I've come through the door, because it's quicker. <laughs> Well, what do you fancy for Christmas, said Santa, all twinkly and merry? A fur coat or a bike? You can have what you like. In the meantime, bung over the sherry. Well, they couldn't decide what they wanted. A new car, a subscription to Booper, a pedestal mat. Well, they thought about that. Father Christmas passed out in a stupor. <laughs> he was out of his brains. He was legless. The late night and the sherry had wrecked him. He lay on the floor till a quarter to four when some reindeer arrived to collect him. <laughs> Well, Santa waved from the sleigh and said, See you, Merry Christmas, and be of good cheer. As he rose from the crescent, Mum said, Where's our present? He said, Oh, sod it, I'll bring it next year. Thank you very much for that. <laughs>